Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex. I work at the Pierce County Library System in the Pierce County region of Washington State, so about two to three hours north of here. Uh, I work as a youth services librarian, which makes it doubly odd that I am here talking to you about this, as youth services is not generally known for necessarily their uh, interests in high technology things, or for that matter, for being men, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I am an interruptible speaker if you are getting to this presentation live, so if you have questions or other things that need more explanation, please feel free to raise your hand. I will do my best to get to you either during the presentation or afterward, but if I don't get to you, please don't feel slighted or stunned. I probably just need to make sure I got everything in and on time. And as you can see, I am easily findable throughout the conference. Um, my email address at my workplace and my Twitter handle are on this first slide here. Um, that's supposed to be he of Hawaiian shirts, which for those of you who are present and can see the fact that I'm wearing a purple floral French shirt, makes a lot more sense when I did that. Uh, there's a little bit to know about me as a person. Um, I've been working as a youth services librarian for about eight years now. Um, this has been my first job out of college, and it's been a trip uh, the whole way there. But beyond that, I have been using open source software. Um, most notably, some flavor of Linux has been my primary desktop operating system for about 12 years now. Oh, and I have been playing video games of all sorts, shapes, and sizes of well, well before that. I have very fond memories of rolling the score on the Atari 2600 Space Invaders, for example. Well, that'll probably give you an idea of how old I actually am and how long I've been playing. However, my point, uh, this talk was originally just going to be called The Public Library is an Open Source Institution. And no, almost no qualifier about it because I work in a public library, and I think a lot of the goals that we have as a public library are aligned with open source and open source citizenship. Uh, and there are a lot of things that are necessary to open source projects that we do really well. Things like documentation of our processes, as which you can see on the slides are things like classification schemes, subject headings, policies about what we do and how we do things. We do a lot of writing of documents in the public library. They come in handy later when you have to reference them for good behavior, bad behavior, or other behavior, but we do a lot, a lot of document writing when it comes to these things, things. Um, as well as organization of materials, commentaries on issues. Generally, your public library is probably generating reams and reams of paper, either electronically or in person, about the decisions that they're making, about the things that they're interested in, their positions on things, how you should behave, just we do a lot of documentation in public libraries. And for a lot of open source software and projects that I've seen and used, sometimes the documentation is more than a little sparse about usage, about extension, and sometimes even lacking licensing agreements or other sorts of permission statements that go along with it. So well, we've got that documentation part that sometimes seems really hard, really well down. Um, and as an institution, of course, we generally tend to be open about how we do things, like how we buy books, how we process them, how we get rid of them, what your checkout processes are, what you need to get a library card, or all of these things. We don't generally hide behind any sort of proprietary or private or otherwise you can't see what we do kind of things. Because being a public library, we're actually interested in having people come and see us and use us and feel comfortable with us rather than going to somewhere else, which may or may not be as transparent about what their processes are and things. So the initial idea for this presentation was going to be a whole lot of, yay, public libraries, how great we are. You can just put all of these components together, and you're going to make an instant library. I mean, we even have integrated library systems, things that handle things like registering people and checking out books and assessing fines and paying fines and all those lovely day-to-day -day operations that your public library handles. We have open source versions of them. We have two of them even, both Evergreen and Koha are excellent systems. And there are lots of libraries that use them to their fullest potential and then contribute new things to them as they realize that there are things that they need to do with it. But, um, and of course, library school is not exactly a, a thing that is shrouded in mystery and secrecy. It looks like it from the outside, but <laughs> as librarians, actually a lot of the things that we do are, again, process documented. We offer books on people who are thinking about joining the library profession that will tell you what you're going to get into if you decide you want to join up. Uh, so there was just a whole lot of stuff that I thought, 
well, we're clearly an open source sort of institution, and you could put everything together just from the documents. You hire the right people, all the systems come in place, instant library, go. Oh, we can show these open source people a thing or two about how to do this right. And then, and as with many projects born out of hubris, reality sets in. And more specifically in our case, public libraries tend to use the Dewey Decimal Classification as their nonfiction sorting session. Uh, many of you probably learned Dewey Decimal at a much earlier age. Some of you have forgotten it by now, but many of you probably still remember it. And the problem with Dewey is that it is, in fact, a proprietary product. Uh, um, the OCLC, which has gone through many name changes, but always has been OCLC when it's been there, has done a lot of things about getting Dewey out and in and useful, but they have always maintained that it is, in fact, their product, and that you can license it if you like, like as part of an annual subscription to learn how to do your Dewey Decimal numbers properly on your spine labels for books and other sorts of things like that. Despite it being a well-known system, it is not actually open source. First, you have to pay a subscription fee to access the tools and the methodology behind it so that you can put things in their proper places. As Dewey also has a few other problems with it. Um, we are currently on Dewey Decimal Classification number 21, um, but the Dewey Decimal Classification has been in existence for about 150 years now which I believe puts it on a slower update schedule than even the most um, stable of Debian Linux releases. <laughs> As, and even then, Dewey still has some clear bugs in it. If you take a look at the 200 section of Dewey, it is supposed to be the section about religion. And, but 200 to about 290 or so is completely concerned with various forms, facets, publications, and other stuff having to do with one religion, Christianity. Okay. The rest of the 290 to 299 covers everything else. And that's assuming that whatever belief system you have has been officially recognized by a religion by the people who do Dewey Decimal. Like the entire neo-paganism movement that's been going on for a long time is stuck in spirituality and ghosts in the 133s. And no one has yet managed to get that untangled and put in its proper place yet. So, there are a lot of things about Dewey that actually don't work very well at all. They don't update particularly often, and when they do, they seem to have a bit of a blind spot towards certain bugs that have crept into their system over time. There are some neat things you can do with Dewey as well, involving number flips with languages and literatures, but as an organizational system, it's popular, it's used, but it's not necessarily actually something you want to take on. Onward. Of course you wouldn't do that, aren't you? <laughs> we are inspecting the uh, presentation as it appears to have decided to crash on me. I will try to get that back to correctness. There we go. Oh, the other big component of library work is something called resource description and access. Um, we used to call these the Anglo-American cataloging rules, but for obvious reasons in the name. You can see why that might not survive into a world that is increasingly interconnected and international. Well, so now we call it resource description and access. It was a major revision from those rules to make it a little bit better to use elsewhere to be more descriptive about it. Great refinements that go along to the process, but it too is a subscription only resource. You cannot get resource description and access for free anywhere. You can purchase it from the American Library Association and their partners who help develop it. But you can get the underlying philosophical statements about what built resource description and access in RDA. Right? Things that have lovely names like Ferber and Farad. Right? Functional requirements for both bibliographic records, which are things that have books and CDs and that that have records, and authority descriptions, which are things like, how do you know that this Miley Cyrus is this Miley Cyrus and not that Miley Cyrus somewhere else? else. Um, so you can read those um, philosophy statements online. We love doing documentation about philosophy and things. But the actual rules involved for cataloging materials such that they will be in the right place with the right subject descriptors and be findable by the library systems and things like that, that is not available anywhere except as a subscription yearly, which you can pay 
handsomely for if you would like to be able to do things according to the rules that are there. This is not an optimal solution by any standards. As some of you might have guessed, um, it leads to a lot of issues. And that's just sort of the things in the library world that are causing problems for us to try and be more open source. There are a whole host of things that are happening outside the library world that affect library users and libraries as that are making it even harder for us to be able to do that. Um, many of our integrated library systems, those day-to-day -day operational things, operate strictly on proprietary operating systems like Windows. Most of my library system uses Polaris, which is a Windows exclusive object. You can't get it on any other system. Um, even though the company that has it, that has bought it now, also offers a product for Linux. Um, but it's a completely different product. They're not going to merge them anytime soon. But a lot of these systems are only built for certain operating systems, which if you have them is great, but if you don't, you're going to have to make an investment for it too. Oh, and we've gone from, as a public library, we've sort of gone from being a valued community institution that helps people find resources and material. Well, we still do that, but, but in terms of people who are wanting to sell you things, a public library is sort of the equivalent of in-person piracy for a lot of them. And we lend books out for free, and we only charge people if they bring them back. Like, okay, we lend digital materials out. And again, we only charge people if they bring them back late. We don't necessarily put in restrictions about content and such that you can only do this and that with the machine so that it's all according to their specifications. And so we had a bit of a problem. Several of the major uh, book publishing industries last year decided they were going to either uh, charge us a lot more. No, they still do that. They charge us about six times the normal book price for a electronic copy of an ebook. And it's just one copy, so we can only lend that one copy out. It's not like it's unlimited simultaneous use or anything like that. It's one copy that you can lend out on our platform to your users if you would like. And you're going to pay us multiple times the list price of a paper book to be able to do that. And one of the companies says after it's been checked out 26 times, you have to rebuy it. And one company was for the longest time just flat out refusing to sell us any of their work at all because they didn't like us that much and they would much prefer people just bought their materials from stores so that they could realize a profit instead of losing money, which, you know, in scare quotes, that's because there's a lot of discovery that goes on from library freedoms. But we basically got cast in the role as, as pirates. And we had to work very hard to at least come to some sort of agreement to be able to offer their materials. And it was not a good agreement. It's very much favored in their ways. And the movie studios did it to us, too. Oh, we now get the rental versions of uh, new releases instead of the full with special features kinds. We get the same kind of ones that you get out of a red box or a video store if any of them actually still existed. Um, so we just get the film and nothing more with it. We used to be able to get the full thing. So a lot of the content companies are starting to see their public libraries as competition for dollars and profits in their bottom lines, rather than as valued community partners that help spread the word about things. And we can even point to studies that say, you know, when people check stuff out from the public library, they tend to buy more things. But bottom lines being what they are and profit focus as what it is, we're getting increasingly shut out of this process and it's not particularly fun. Um, this is also um, in addition to snooping on our peoples, which we had a nice big scandal last year that one of the more popular platforms for checking out electronic books, Adobe Digital Editions, was sending in the clear what people were checking out and reading on their platform as well as information about their computers back to their servers. Now, for us, who, for a public library, who, you know, we like to believe that privacy is an important value of us, this is a big, big no-no. Oh, and especially they did it without telling us when they were doing it. We just had to have them, someone discover that it was going on. And we were very unhappy about that as a public library. But you know, people come into the library to use our computers as well, and so they interact with places like Facebook and Twitter and Google. All of these corporations that we have seen, even including in the keynote, where they're, they're trying to sell people to 
corporations about that. And so they just encourage the disclosure of information that sort of comes at odds with the library's mission of providing privacy and security to people in their browsing. So we're having we're hit, stuck at a crossroads here where the world is moving in one direction, corporately speaking. We'd like to keep up with them, but they're starting to do a lot of things that we don't like and that are starting to run across purposes with our ideals. And that's, of course, before you get to talk about the government and who, um, as part of the still maintained USA Patriot Act, can make a records request of any of your public library records. They don't actually have to provide proof enough to get a search warrant for it from court. Right? And they usually accompany it with an order that says, no, you're not allowed to talk about it when we do it, either. All right, we only know that it exists because there's been one successful case in 2006 where a public library actually challenged the no, you don't get to talk about it order and won. So they do get to talk about it, but everybody else doesn't. So it is thoroughly possible that within the last 14 years, a government entity has visited your public library looking for records about somebody, maybe you, maybe somebody else, and your public library had to comply with that request because of the law, but they could not disclose that it happened, which, you know, for people who like privacy and security, this is a big thing. And to not be able to actually tell your users that the government was snooping, big, big problems. In addition to that, we have uh, a, uh, most rural libraries and less funded libraries often take advantage of the government discount toward technology and uh, internet access services that's sort of bundled into it called the E-rate. You actually pay some of that when you pay your universal service fee for your media items. And some of that money actually comes back to your public library and discounts for their internet access. But as a condition of taking that internet access, we have to then put in uh, technology prevention measures that prevent the depiction of something that would be considered obscene, harmful to minors. So that the Children's Internet Protection Act basically defines this as a requirement. Um, how that usually works out is filtering software, which I suspect, as most people here know, does not actually work like it's supposed to. It filters out things that it shouldn't. It lets through things that it should be blocking. And um, teenagers are very good at figuring out which is which. <laughs> And so any enterprising teenager with enough time will figure out a way to circumvent any sort of filtering that is in place. But that's a requirement of the law. Any computer that could be accessed by someone under 17, if you want your discounted internet rate, you have to put in some sort of technology prevention measure. There are other ways of doing it, but filters generally tends to be the one that everybody works with. And then, of course, there's all of that lovely information that they have been capturing through the data streams that we have no real control over, like tapping directly into the telecoms, or getting large corporations like Google and Facebook to simply provide your data to them, with maybe with a warrant, maybe not, at their request. These are things that we can't necessarily even control in a public library, but that are affecting the people that use our libraries in terms of privacy and security. So, on sort of all the fronts that a library is used to being able to provide services from, we're under siege. If corporations would like us to disappear so that everybody has to buy things, the government doesn't like us a whole lot because we try to provide private, secure access for sensitive topics or just general research, other sorts of things there. And so, we're kind of going to be on the creek if we try to keep doing things the same way that we have been. And it's part of our nature to be, we used to be able to be sort of the guardians of approved things, culture, entertainment, knowledge. Now, library selection is a big thing when it's in there. But the problem with that is, is as things continue to work on, we're lose, trying to hang on to that role of guardianship is a losing bet. Right? Because there are so many different ways that people can get stuff or information or knowledge that doesn't have to involve a public library at all. And you can see on the slide here or that you're basically covered on the gamut of media, digital or physical. Books can be served by anybody, music, games, even physical objects, you know, two-day Amazon delivery. I keep thinking that everybody thinks that that drone delivery is a joke. I'm not so sure about that. I think they're going to figure out how to clear airspace for that. So. 
Well, but as you can see, you can go through life getting all the things that you actually want, and you never actually have to interact with a public library. Right? You used to have to actually do some of those things for things that were there. And of course, if you don't actually want to pay for your purchases, or there are other things that you can't actually get your hands on, there are, of course, very enterprising services that will more than happily discover any sort of content that you're interested in and serve it to you as fast as your internet connection will allow. Um, for some of them, you may have to think about properly protecting yourself against infringement notices and uh, copyright things as well. But they exist. And so, quite frankly, the public library simply as that place where you get your stuff and where you get all of those lovely approved things, things is going away. Right? More and more people are going to be able to completely circumvent the public library as a place to get your stuff. Um, Eli Nyberger, who's done a lot of great work, um, both in bringing games into library, but also talking about the state of libraries, gave a two-part talk entitled, Libraries Are Screwed. But, uh, that was about this kind of situation, where the changing face of technology and of libraries and all of these things is making the public library, as we thought about it, becoming rapidly obsolete. Now, this is an optimistic talk. You've got to listen all the way through to the end of part two, oh, because the first part will paint a very dire picture. If you really want to listen all the way through to part two, there are some solutions and things in that. But it's the writing is on the wall. A public library has to change if it wants to stay a relevant institution to people. I think a lot of times with people, they remember the public library as the place they used to go to to get picture books, and then there were programs and summer reading, which is going on right now. Well, and then they hit about college age, or they went out into the adult working world, and a lot of people, the public library vanishes from their thought process. And then they have kids, and then they remember. Or, or we have one of those world-shattering events like, oh, say, a housing bubble that causes a years-long economic crash. And then people remember, oh, yeah, I can get the internet access at the library. I can work on my resume at the library. And it's free, so I can save some money by going. But in a situation where everything is sort of humming along hunky-dory, most adults do not have the public library in mind when they think about a lot of their things. But there are really good reasons to keep a public library around. I mean, after the about two lattes a week or so that you pay in taxes to your library district, right, you get lots of free stuff. And this is both free as in beer, definition and free as in freedom. So on the free as in beer department, right, there's all that stuff that's there. You can still check it out with your library card for free, just bring it back on time, you know how it is. As more and more libraries are becoming places that people can meet and use space for. Our, our meeting rooms are in high, high demand because more often than not in your town, the public library might be the only place that actually offers free community space that has no strings attached to it. But you can register, you can get it, you may have to fight everybody else for it, right? and so you might be meeting at 7 o'clock on a Thursday night because it's the only time that was open, but it's there. You don't have to buy anything to use a library meeting room, and so it's one of the last remaining places in the community that you can actually use for free. But of course, we've got internet access as well, which is becoming more and more a staple of everyday life right? as things migrate online to filling out forms and government services and other sorts of necessities. If you don't have an email address, you're going to find you're going to need one real soon. We're starting to develop that thought of also being a place where you can access what would otherwise be prohibitively expensive to own on your own. When 3D printers are coming down in price, but they're still things that are going to cost a pretty penny to be able to do individually. But the public library applies one or gets donated one, and then suddenly there's a whole host of people who can use 3D printed materials. And of course, we also tend to specialize in the exotics. Some of our collections are great. Um, one of the libraries that's in Pierce County but not associated with mine has a collection of basically Pacific Northwest history in the building which is relevant to the people who are in the Pacific Northwest who are looking for that, but you probably could never actually make as a commercial venture as a success. That's even though 
clear historical needs and other things that go along with it. We also invest in the freedom aspect of free. Um, as much as we try, anyway, and sometimes fail, uh, the library still actually believes that your privacy is important, and, and we don't collect your information to sell it to advertisers. As in fact, we have been known to tell advertisers and government agents to buzz off if they come snooping around for things without their proper documentation. I've seen that happen. It is a glorious, glorious thing. If you're in a library building or working with a public library, you can access everything that we have. Um, with a library card, you can often access it remotely. Okay? But it, at least if you actually get to your public library, anything that's available, you can use. That's, and there are no strings attached to that. It's not, you can only use this if you make this much money. You can only use this if you present this way. You can only use this if, if it's open and you're here, you can use it. That's the easy part. Um, we try to maintain a diverse collection of materials, um, but we probably fail at that more often than we succeed. And because, as we'll show in a few slides, um, the population of people who work in a library does not reflect the population of people who use a library by a long shot. Uh, so we are subject to our own inherent biases and our own processes and procedures that prevent us from having a truly diverse collection, but at least we acknowledge the fact that we're trying for it, which is, again, kind of small potatoes in a lot of ways, but it's there. And since uh, we learned that the government can make record requests, many of our libraries in the public have decided eh, they can't get what's not there. And so there is a distinct lack of record keeping that often happens with your public library. You can opt into things like having your checkout lists kept if there are things you want to remember later on and that you need to go back to. But generally speaking, so long as you bring your stuff back on time and there is no one in the library or on any of the library servers that says you checked this thing out. Once it's back in, it's just another book in the system. Um, it was checked out, it is no longer. Part of change, of course, rely, means adaptation to the new. Oh, and I like to think that libraries now are sort of like how trying to use a Linux system in about 2003 was. As I tried it. Um, this was back when Mandrake was Mandrake and not Mandriva and still in existence. But trying to get sound set up on that system was a pain. I had lots of searching, lots of drivers, lots of, and it still didn't really work like it was supposed to. Um, nowadays, of course, many Linux systems come with sound pre-configured, right, or several options for configuring, and they work. You don't have to worry about them. And you can update them by entering you know, one of two commands, if it's sort of an Ubuntu-based system, um, or one if you're using Arch or some other system that works just as a you know, one command, whole system updates. Right, so these are the kind of things that people like to be able to have. I just want to remember one command, and it goes. Public libraries need to be more like this. You have a thing and resources appear, rather than having to sort of learn the library way of asking for the thing that you're looking for, fighting with the search engine to see if you get the right terminology, and then seeing it gives you no results, but actually if you just put this in instead of that, you find you actually have plenty of material for the question that you're looking for. So we need to be able to bring ourselves forward in the future to be able to make things just work. And we're kind of crap at that a lot of the time. And that's, we do a lot of focus on library buildings as well, which is great if you can get to a library building. But we have a lot of communities where getting to a library building is not the easiest thing in the world. And so when we concentrate all our resources into the building, we are shortchanging all of those people who could be library users but can't actually get there. So, to combat that idea, um, there are a couple of ideas that have popped up that I like. Um, the Little Free Libraries project is basically I mean, you put books and materials in somewhere for the community to take and exchange and put. And it's a great idea if you can't get to a library building or if you have stuff that won't necessarily get into a library easily. You just put it there, people take it, people exchange. It's a great community meeting point and for distribution of physical objects. 
Um, they don't, they give you plans on how you could build one, but I've seen them build out of everything from scrap wood to an old newspaper delivery box. So you can have all sorts of ingenuity involved. They will want you to pay a small fee so that you can register yours as an official little free library. Because on the website, you get a nice shiny plaque to put on yours. But there's no restriction in the sense of, you can build one. They just want you to pay a little money to register it. And then along with that, you know, because a lot of our goods are digital as well as physical, well, there's this project called Pirate Box. And it has a sport spin-off called Library Box, which is basically that you could take an old router or an old mobile phone, or even a Raspberry Pi computer, or other such on a stick. And it basically generates a wireless access point that has no internet access, but has storage for people to put things. Thanks. Thanks. I've actually got one of those running right now off of this lovely old mobile phone of mine. It's a great way of repurposing technology. Um, you can see what's on it by connecting to the wireless network called Key of High Shirts Box which means you will have to disconnect from the conference wireless to do that. Um, it has the slides, it also has the presentation in PDF form and a document that I wrote that was going to be if I had an infinite amount of time to talk about this, what I'd actually be saying. Okay. Um, that'll be still here for the whole time and, and it's, uh, it's running off of an Android version of Pirate Box, so it also accepts uploads. The library box version does not because libraries getting accused of uh, facilitating copyright infringement is not on our actual playlist of things we'd like to do. Um, so the library box version is great for distribution one way down. Um, but if you put that with a little free library together, what you basically create, and here's the game, what you will basically create by putting the two of them together is a point for the community to be able to distribute both physical and digital objects. Okay. Since there's no internet access on the library box, you have to actually be close enough to catch the signal and then be able to pull what's there. Or so if you have somebody who's worried about internet distribution of their materials, else you could stick it on one of those and it's geographically limited. You'd have to apply some power solutions to it, maybe a hand crank battery or some solar panels or other sorts of things so that the router keeps a nice handy 5 volt supply going for everybody who comes by. But this is the sort of thing that an open software or open hardware department probably could take on and design some blueprints for and manufacture. So, this is a great way of collaborating with your community as a library and as a community. You leave your materials here, you take other materials that look interesting. You don't need a library building for it. Right. So some of these um, then involve building communities, and I'm going to have to speed a little bit through this, but when it comes to building communities in libraries, that's sort of where we're going now. Well, no longer are we having to be just a place of stuff, we're now a space for people to collaborate with. And we did some good stuff online. I get to talk good things about my institution. And, um, our summer, per summer reading program was not getting a whole lot of attendance, and the people who were were making it so that statistically speaking, we looked like we were doing fine, but it was a, lot of, a small amount of people doing a lot of amount of work. And so rather than just continue to focus on just summer reading and in a physical form, we took it digital. We created a teen summer challenge online, which we grabbed an off-the-shelf WordPress installation, added some plugins, um, and threw it up as a idea that people would be more, teenagers would be more willing to do rather than to just read as part of their summer experience. And it took off quite well. The first year we did it, more than 600 registrations, and a little over half of the people who were there actually did something on the site that would give them points. Um, we still had a small group of people who were really sort of the core of everything, but we had a pretty good group of people who were just checking it out even just to see what was was there. From that, it actually evolved into what we now call the Interactive Discovery Platform. We got a Paul G. Allen grant to develop this thing out completely so that we could host more than just one thing on this platform. Um, we created an adult version of Teen Summer Challenge, basically called Scout, and we revamped the Teen Summer Challenge to work with the IDP. We, um, that Teen Summer Challenge actually is doing its first run right now, and it's doing pretty well. 
world. In person, though, places like the Chattanooga, Chattanooga Public Library in Tennessee, okay, their fourth floor basically is an open space. Okay, it has chairs, it has interesting things for cutting vinyl or laser printing or those kinds of things. Right? But it's basically an open space for people to rearrange as they need to. And they have all sorts of things from community meetings to government, uh, government groups. They've created some really interesting projects, open government work, great things that come out of having just a space for a community to be there. So, well, we're, we're seeing sort of the inklings of this idea, maker spaces, media lab, presentation spaces. We're changing from a place where you get stuff up as a public library to a place where you can meet and collaborate and use space. Nice. Um, up here you can see our library's vision statement, or philosophy, that's our philosophy statement about all of these things that if everything works perfectly, this is what we're going to do. Um, but when it comes to actual implementation, as one might guess, if you don't do your testing correctly, you have a rather large potential of failure. There are things like equitable service when you're a system that has big branches and small branches. That becomes a bit of a trick. And where did the professional staff go? And so what we basically generated was this sort of one desk model where everyone is supposed to just work a desk and professionals get to go out into the community and the others stay here. It didn't. And the, the economic recession didn't help, but it didn't work. It was, in fact, pretty, pretty failure. Which reads, today's experiment failed. So. Instead, what we need for people to do, and especially the open source community in public libraries, if you want, we want to stay relevant, but that means we need your help. We need you to expect more out of us. If you just see us as a place where we can get books for kids, and then that you can get books for kids, and that's all we're going to be, is a place where you can get books for kids. That's instead of all the wonderful potential that we have with other things, like being able to say, assist with resisting the surveillance state, or, or being able to have allies when it comes to politics. Um, in Washington state, getting a, uh, bond, a measure passed to be able to raise the amount of money you can collect is not an easy process. It requires lots of people coming out to vote, and then plenty of those people who came out to vote actually saying yes to what you want to do, which is difficult to do in an anti-government era or when you're constrained by someone who likes to put up citizen initiatives saying government bad, no government, never. But we also need experts. Um, lots and lots of experts. Because as a public library, we're really great about breadth of knowledge. We can get you started on any path that you would so choose. But if you're really interested in that thing, you are soon going to eclipse our knowledge about it. I would love to be able to say that a public librarian is an expert on all things, but the truth is, is we're actually just really good at getting people going and then they find their expertise on the go. So what we need then is to have experts and other people who are there to catch somebody who's gone beyond our capabilities, right? which means both being able to volunteer with us, but also means developing things for us to help us get out of things like proprietary operating systems, or proprietary integrated library systems, or the Dewey Decimal Classification, because that really isn't working all that well either. So there are lots of places where you can lend your talents to. Oh, we also need you to actually provide us input when we say something like, we're going to build a new library building. What do you want to see? Hey, we've got a small group of people who come out and say, we want it the same as it was before. Why are you tearing down the old building? It worked just fine. Instead, what we need people are to say, oh good, that means you have time to put in this fab lab and this community meeting space and these lovely movable shelves so that we can rearrange everything the way we want. That's the kind of input we need when we're designing buildings and spaces. As, and actually, we, we kind of need more diverse workforces because, especially in new services, the library world is mostly white people and mostly women, excepting perhaps in administration and some technology affairs. So we actually need more diverse workplaces so that we can not run into those traps that were described in the keynote and in other sessions about how do you make a diverse workplace? Well, we 
kind of need people with perspectives to tell us what we're screwing up on, because there are a lot of things that we're screwing up on. That's why you're not here. This is the shift that we're looking for, to go from answers, definitive answers, to information, and from solving problems of not enough information to problems of too much, much from being in one building to many places, from being sort of an authoritative place to a community partner, from proprietary and intrusive ways to open and private ways, but basically, you know, from our way that we've always done it to the way that you actually want us to do it. But for that, we need your help. So the public library can be an open source institution, but not of the way that we're going and not without help. This is some licensing information for Creative Commons, so if there's anything that you like and you'd like to steal, that's just kind of me. Um, anything that might come along with that may not be governed by the license, including the audio and video recordings of this. Yes. And I had to put something in there about how I got here from here with these slides that JS did. But otherwise, thank you for your attention. I have hopefully managed to not exceed my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.